שלום, שלום וברכה, מורים יקרים, מנהלים יקרים, ברוכים הבאים למפגש השלישי שלנו עם מנהלים מעוררי השראה מרחבי העולם. שלום לכל המשתתפים בתוכנית העצמה רוחנית רוץ, והיום איתנו מברזיל, מסאן פאולו, אני בירושלים. היא בסן פאולה, שלום למנהלת, חני ביגון, שלום וברכה. שלום, שלום סיוון, איזה כבוד להיות פה להשתתף איתכם, זה כבוד מאוד גדול, it's a big big honor. Mm, תודה רבה. עוד מעט נדבר איתך על איך מחנכים בבית ספר יהודי שבו חלק מהילדים אפילו לא שומרים את יום כיפור, איך מחנכים ומנהלים בית ספר כשיש שמונה ילדים בלי עין הרע גם בבית. עוד מעט נשמע את כל זה מהגברת ביגון, אבל קודם כל אנחנו בפרויקט המיוחד הזה עם השותפים, סגנית ראש מינהל החמד, הגברת מיכל דהן. דברי ברכה קצרים, ואנחנו מתחילים. שלום, שלום, שמחה להיות עם העוסקים בחינוך בארץ ובברזיל. שלום לכולם ובהצלחה בעבודה החשובה. הנושא של חינוך לאפקטיביות יהודית, או כמו שאנחנו קוראים לזה פה, הנושא של טיפוח זהות ציונית דתית, הוא נושא שמאוד מעסיק אותנו, אנחנו חושבים שהוא הנושא הכי משמעותי במלאכה, במלאכת החינוך ומתמודדים איתו בדרכים שונות, במסגרת תוכנית הלימודים, בשיעורי הלמידה, במסגרת התוכנית החברתית הערכית, בשיתוף עם הורים, בשיתוף עם קהילה אבל אני רוצה להגיד משהו, אני חושבת, הכי הכי משמעותי אנחנו עסוקים כל הזמן בשאלה למה מורה נכנס לכיתה למה? מורה נותן מבחן, האם רק כדי לעקוב על ההתפתחות הלימודית או גם לתת מזה מעבר? ואנחנו מבקשים מבתי הספר ואפילו מגנים שלנו לחקוק על הראש, על לוח ליבם, מהי מלאכת החינוך? בית ספר, בית חינוך, מקנה ידע ומעצב זהות ביחד. הידע הוא מאוד מאוד משמעותי, אבל הוא לא עומד רק בפני עצמו. הוא ביחד עם הנושא של טיפוח הזהות. יש לי זיכרון שאני תמיד מספרת אותו, האסון של מירון חל, קרה ביום חמישי בשבוע, וביום ראשון הייתי בכיתה בשיעור גמרא. הש... הגמרא באותו יום למדו את מסכת יומא, ובאותו יום הגמרא עסקה בשאלת הצפיפות שהייתה בבית המקדש. איזה מקום של רלוונטיות מפעם להיום, מהי צפיפות, איך מתמודדים איתה, מה תפקידנו, שאלות חינוכיות, שאלות שמדברות על אני חוליה בשרשרת הדורות, שאלות ששואלות את יומנו אנו, מה המשמעות שלי היום, ובעיקר אומרות למורה, למחנך, לכל אחד מאנשי החינוך בבית הספר, מה, למה אנחנו קמים לעבודת החינוך. נשמח להיות בקשר ולספר מה אנחנו עושים. גם אנחנו בשאלות, בתהייה, נשמח לומר שזאת המשימה החשובה במלאכת החינוך. שאו ברכה, הרבה הצלחה. תודה לגברת מיכל דהן, ושוב שלום, חני ביגון, המנהלת של אסכולה בית יעקב סן פאולו, אמרתי את זה נכון? כמעט נכון, אסכולה בית יעקב. אסכולה, זה סקול, זה סקול. כן, כן, כן. בית יעקב בישראל זה סמינרים, זה בדרך כלל חרדי, אתם ממש לא בית ספר חרדי כמו שכבר אפשר היה להבין. אז אנחנו עוד מעט נשמע מה זה בית יעקב של סן פאולו, ו-now we will start speaking in English, we have subtitles in Hebrew for the teachers and the principals here. Um, five chapters, five I would say messages or lessons or pe- periods in your life, and we'll start with the personal one. Tell me about the young girl, Hani, Uh, that was born in Sao Paulo and grew up to be the principal of that big school there. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Sivan. First of all, I like the young girl. I want to keep young. I want, I'm convincing myself that I could always remain young. So <laughs> my name is Khani Begun. Uh, my uh, maiden name is Goldstein. I was born here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. My grandparents came Um, escaping uh, Europe right before the war. And it's not too common, not for those days, but my husband is also Brazilian. And uh, we grew up here and we came here to do our shlichut as well. And uh, basically you grew up there, you learned, you went to New York to learn uh, education? 
learn to be a teacher? Uh, no, I stayed in Brazil. I actually went to the other Betiakov, the Betiakov you're talking about. Hmm. Um, 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 and I finished high school in Betiakov. Then for, se for um, seminary and then college, I went to um, New York where I got my degree and we got married and I came back. Growing up in Brazil was nothing like uh, raising your kids here in Sao Paulo today. Thank God the community grew a lot, developed itself a lot. So it feels like it, a different place completely um, from finding um, kosher food to having like a social life and a whole community. So yes. thank God today, um, Sao Paulo grew and it's a very Jewish city. <laughs> and Sao Paulo is also growing thanks to your big, big uh, family. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about it. <laughs> okay, so um, I have Baruch Hashem eight kids ranging from 24 years old and eight years old. I have two kids are married, thank God. I am a, a very proud grandmother of a six months old baby. Wow. And it wasn't easy uh, raising a large family in a place where the culture does not see it as something common or something normal. But thank God, like everything Jewish, you have to be different. Uh, my biggest challenge was um, trying to be a good mom, a good wife, and a good worker. I always worked my whole life. But um, thank God, I think um, both uh, sides benefited. My professional side and my personal side um, benefited from the fact that I blended um, my job and my family. What is the best message you have after all those years? Now you're a safta mazaltov. But uh, many of the listeners here, big families, Hashem, mishpachot bruchot yeladim, we call it in Hebrew, and they also juggle, you know. So what uh, what tips can you give us from Sao Paulo? Well, I think the first message that I have um, that I would like to give after having my experiences, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because atzlachat azman, it's something that you need siyata dishmaya. Sometimes uh, you have little kids, uh, you have a, a small family, sometimes you have plenty of time and you still don't manage to do what you have to do because of other challenges that comes your way. And sometimes like marrying off a child when you work eight to 10 hours a day and you have an engagement of two months and you see things coming so smooth, you know that this is siyata dishmaya. So don't be scared, don't be afraid. Um, Hashem will help you, it's possible. And also like today, mm -hmm. they talk so much about the importance of uh, mindfulness and therapy and doing something that you like and enjoy. So definitely going out every day and feeling the accomplishment of work, going home to your family, your kids will feel that they will benefit from, from, from your well-being. That's so, beautiful. If you're happy as a mother, they will be happy kids. Yes, yes. And the same goes to school. I feel like if you have a, a, a life of so many experiences, you have a, a lot, once you leave school and you go to your house and you have a, such a dynamic routine, you bring back to your work as well. Mm -hmm. So you bring things from school to your house and uh, you bring things from your house to school, back to school. Yes, definitely. Fascinating. Okay, so that's, what, that's maybe the first uh, part we, to get to know you a little bit. The second one is about being a teacher. And it's interesting, it's a very short period, three years as, as a teacher and you got promoted. But tell us a little bit about those three years um, as a young mother, I guess, you enter the class and so uh, we got to know you a little bit. That was the first part. Now I wanna move forward to the second part of your life, being a teacher. And it was really a short period, three years in Bet Yaakov as a teacher and you got promoted. Tell us about those years. You entered the class and what happened? Okay, I, before I entered the class, uh, going to school, driving to school was already a big challenge. I was working for many, many years in a different school. So making a change when you're in your 30s and you think you have everything figured out, it's quite challenging, but in a, it's a challenge in a good way. I was very positive and I was very optimistic and I was very happy to go through this process. Then I came the first day of school, even before my students came, we had a, an orientation meeting and I just, I was very um, shocked 
to see the, the challenges that the teachers who were there before me, they were mentioning. And one of them, they were very concerned about the indifference in today's uh, youth that they could say a good morning to a student and not even receive the good morning back. I didn't take it as a criticism that didn't frighten me, the opposite. I took it as a personal challenge. I took it as a mission. And I decided that I'm gonna come even earlier than we have to. And it was not easy because school here starts at 7.30 a.m. So that wow. means- Seven, Wait a minute, 7.30 yes. every morning. 7.30 every morning, we have wow. to teach, we have a lot to teach. We have the Brazilian curriculum, we have the, uh, the whole Jewish curriculum. So students come here, they stay from 7.30 to four o'clock. So I came a little earlier and I greeted the children. Um, I made sure to learn the children's, uh, the students' name by heart very much in the beginning. And I thank God for that. I think it's a talent, I think it's a gift that I don't want to take for granted. And I think they were shocked. The students were very surprised. Who's this person? How do they think they know me that they're saying good morning in my own name? But slowly wow. but surely, every child in their own speed, I received a good morning back and they knew who I am. And I think we built a connection. Besides, besides for proving myself that every child, no child is indifferent, um, we build a connection, we build an interaction. And I think that made my difference here at Betiakov. And today wow. in the role of a director, I make sure to um, talk about it with the teachers. Um, knowledge, you can learn. You can read a good book the night before, you can prepare a good class and you can deliver it to the student. But the interaction, the affectivity, it's something that if you don't build, you're losing so much. You're losing much more than the knowledge that they could eventually find on Google or somewhere else. Wow, and I think that makes a big difference. I guess that good morning story and the teacher they, that learned the names by heart, I guess it, it became part of your history, that story. <laughs> I think so. And, and, and thank God it's a history that it's not over. Like today we have students who are married and I know that if they have any question um, in terms of Judaism, but sometimes in terms of life, they know that they could reach out and they do. And that gives me a lot of, first of all, I'm very proud of them, but it gives me a lot of satisfaction also. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so three years and a teacher, and then uh, you became Menahelet of the Tichon, and then uh, you, now you're uh, um, Menahelet of the Yahadut part, Chativa plus Tichon. That, that's yes. a lot. Yes. Yes, yes. I first became the Rakezet in the Tichon, and then I took the Menahelet, Chativa, and Tichon. Yes, I think um, the, the, probably the turning point was after we came back from a trip with the students, and it was a very successful trip. And right after that trip, I was invited to take over as the Rakezet. So sometimes we do little things that are above and beyond our roles as teachers. This was a trip that we did during vacation, but I think it did make a difference in my career here at Betyakov. Why, why, what was so successful and special in this trip? It was a trip, we, may, we have a trip, uh, like our yearly trip to the March of the Living. We do a week in Europe and then um, 10 days, two weeks in Israel afterwards. And, I just, I didn't sleep the entire trip. Like every moment, it was a moment, either to do something with the students or if there was a particular student that wanted to talk to you. It, it was such a moment that their, their, their hearts were open and we couldn't miss any opportunity. So I think like being on duty 24, literally 24 seven um, gave me, but gave school also the confidence that we can do it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And as a, a principal, I asked you earlier when we spoke, what is the main message? What do you want to say today? And you said you said it in Hebrew that you have your, I would say, key words, latet bama layelet, to give the child, the student, the space, the place he needs. What do you mean, latet bama layelet? Okay, so we discuss this a lot as, as a teacher, as a group, as school. Latet bama layelet, it's today's student, they get the information everywhere, and we know that. They are sometimes more aware than us. So we don't need to come and teach them anything. We have to develop on them 
the passion, the desire, the curiosity to learn by themselves. And we have to be there just to mediate them, just to give them the right, to put them on the right track. And I think more and more, um, it's hard, it's not easy, it's a challenge, but the more the students do on their own, that's what lasts, that's what stays, and that's what gives them a lot more meaning um, in the, in the, um, um, in their life. <laughs> the process, yes, yeah. yes, in mm -hmm. their life. So give me some examples of Latet Bamalayeled. How do you make them involved, engaged, active? Okay, so um, I, I could give you the examples that happen on a daily basis, but I also would like to tell you a little bit, how do we prepare the teachers for that? So okay. for example, we just came back from Purim. We, a lot of things that goes on in school, instead of us teachers or us staff organizing and preparing and running it, we let students prepare and organize and it's run uh, for students. So for example, we have over here like a whole um, a parallel um, curriculum on Chesed. We, we give a lot of importance to Chesed project, projects in school. And our kids, it's mandatory, especially on middle and high school, that every child engages himself in voluntary social work throughout the year. And we have a good way of incentivating, but also a way of controlling that they're all doing it. And it, they do it from the beginning to end. So they have it, uh, in their daily routine or weekly routine, to be more honest, um, times that they um, prepare and they, they plan ahead what they're going to be doing for chesed. And then they go out of the field and they do their chesed, for example. So this, it's the perfect example of Latet Bamala Yedet. They do the entire thing. We're just watching them and being there for them. Another mm -hmm. example, when it comes to Chagim and Tarikhim mm Meyuchadim -hmm. Shelanu. Um, so the students, they're the ones um, for Yom HaShoah. They're going to be reaching out the Holocaust survivors. They're going to be uh, planning what's going to be the, the framework of our activities and our ceremony for Yom HaShoah. They run the whole thing for students who are younger than them. So usually we take um, uh, 11th graders on Yom HaShoah, they run for the youngers. We take on Yom HaTzmau 12th graders and so on and so forth. Besides for them, we have our ambassadors in school. So we spent a great deal of our day uh, receiving families that wanted to get to know school. And Baruch Hashem, it's a large school. I don't know if I told you enough, but we have a thousand school, a thousand the Jewish students in our school. Wow, in the thousand students, thousand families. That's a community. Yes, yes, that's a community. Taking into consideration that the the the, the largest school after Bet Yaakov, they have four hundred and fifty students. So mm -hmm. it's very significant. So you are the uh, largest in San Paulo. Yes, not only in San Paulo, I would say we are the largest in Brazil for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Now, um, tell me a little bit about the school's style. I mean, you said you grew up in the different Bet Yaakov, the Haredi Bet Yaakov. Right. You have Sfaradim and Ashkenazim, uh, modern Orthodox, ultra Orthodox. Okay. There's Yiddish. There is uh, um, all kind of, of of languages inside the Jewish community. So tell me about the schools and and about your unique school. I mean, what? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, um, São Paulo, it's a it's a large community. We have uh, three very, really ultra, ultra, ultra orthodox schools for girls, a few more for boys, like five ultra orthodox schools for boys. We have two um, traditional schools um, in the city, and we have one that it's modern orthodox like us. We consider our school more, uh, more modern orthodox. We don't use this terminology. We, we use the terminology of Torah Mada. Um, the school was established 20 years ago um, by the Safra family, by um, Esther Safra Dayan. She envisioned a school that could give an excellent education without compromising the Jewish identity. And we have our mission statement. It's built in the, in the Star of David, in uh, Magen David. We have six um, um, values. And the core value is the Jewish identity. And that's 
what she always um, talks about, that the school would not exist if not for the Jewish identity. So the Jewish identity, it's what makes the school um, exist. Um, throughout the 20 years, we've been receiving more and more students because we are um, a very good school, an excellent school. Our graduates are uh, getting into the best universities in Brazil and all year round, including a lot of students in league universities. And uh, the, 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 school, the school community, it's, it's varied by all kinds of families. So we have the most traditional families. We have some families who are not religious, not traditional at all. We have families that they come to school and they wanna know what's our Jewish curriculum and we have families that come and they're, they want to know if it's obligated, if it's mandatory, or if it's a choice. So we have all kinds of family. Thank God the school has very um, straight directives and guidelines. This is because Mr. Mrs. Esther Safra Dayan, she's here every single day and she knows exactly what she envisions for her school. And that gives us a lot of confidence also. Uh, but it's a big challenge to give a class when you have a student that he knows it all or you have a student that doesn't know it all. You have a student that the family really cares or you have a student that the family says, this is not important for us. So um, that makes our day a little more interesting. <laughs> yes, quite a challenge. Okay, so as a principal, and that's maybe the fourth chapter uh, directly from what you said, I wanted to discuss Torah values, Torah mitzvot. At the end of the day, uh, I guess um, you want your, your students to feel uh, committed. How do you do it when um, uh, sometimes you, you told me earlier they don't even keep Yom Kippur and you have families, it's holy for them, it's important. They know the truth and they, they want their kids to know more. How do you balance? What, what do you do? Okay, so first we believe that three elements are absolutely necessary from day one when they come to school and we have students that come to school when they're six months old because we have our uh, bait kits, it's called, it's for the babies until they are 12th graders and they're graduating school. And those cores are um, Jewish pride, Jewish knowledge, and 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 Jewish keeping. So we believe that you cannot go isolated. You cannot teach a student what, what Judaism expects us to do if you don't give them the pride, if you don't give them just the confidence and the identity. And also, you cannot expect anything if you don't give them the knowledge. So we are very careful to give all three of them in the same, in the same importance. And we have a lot of, uh, one of our biggest satisfaction is that we see our students when they come out of school, whatever they did, they did with pride. They did with happiness. They were not imposed to do, they did because they wanted. We see sometimes students that come from different backgrounds. We have students that come from different schools or different countries that sometimes they have a hard time. And that gives us the feeling and the confidence that we're doing something right because in school, we don't have this um, negativity towards Judaism. I want, to, I want to elaborate because those three principles are important. And the listeners here in Israel, sometimes they deal with families who are Masoti, traditional, and they also send their kids to a Dati school and there is a conflict. So I want to discuss first Jewish pride. How do you create Jewish pride, especially in a Gentile, non-Jewish environment? I guess you do see antisemitism sometimes in, in Sao Paulo, right? Do you go with a kippah? Do you go with them again, David? Okay, so anti-Semitism in Sao Paulo is something very isolated. It's not something yeah. like some right. countries in yeah. Europe we are dealing with this today. This is not a problem. Ignorance, it's more of a problem than anti-Semitism itself. Um, I, I want to share with you a little story that I had with a student, and I think that will give you um, a little bit of what you're asking. Um, I have a student, she was our trip, March of the Living trip, we do when they are in 10th grade. And so they're 14 to 15 years old, they're young. And this specific particular student, she, I used to teach her, I used to be the, the Torah teacher. And every single class, she stayed until the end of the class and she was very educated and she had a lot of good manners and she would say, thank you for the class. Although I have to tell you that I don't agree with you. And I always told her that's fine if she doesn't agree with me. I'm happy 
if I provoked on her any thoughts, because that's the main thing. Like, be, we teach our students to make elaborate questions, never to accept one answer. And I think mm -hmm. that enriches everything. And this was throughout six months. And then we went to our trip. On the trip, she stood next to me. Her house, unfortunately, went on fire two weeks before the trip. Aye. And it was a Shabbat. It was a very special Shabbat. And she was coming next to me. And she says, I have to tell you something that I didn't have the courage to tell you in Sao Paulo. I said, what? So she said, my entire house went on fire. You know that. Everything burned. But what caught my mother, my parents' um, attention and my attention was that the mezuzah was intact when they took off everything and the house was everything black and the, the mezuzah uh, case was plastic. She said the, the cloth was intact, it was nothing. She said, I came to understand that there is something that it's much bigger than my understanding. And this is Hashem. And I was very proud of her that she, that she had the courage, but that she had the reflection to think that way. And this was a student that she said, thank you for everything, but I don't connect myself with anything in Judaism. And I think this was just a result of like from the beginning, ever since she was a little kid, listening to music, uh, listening to stories, having a good interaction with teachers that they could be a good ro role model because this, I also think it adds a lot, developed on her the passion. She was not ready to take any to take on upon herself anything more than the passion to go into the practice. It was already too much, but that's okay as long as she felt proud to say, "I'm a Jew, I'm Israel Chai." That was already the beginning of the seeds that we were planting. So I think, how do we do that? It's very profound, yes, but we do from the beginning in those little things. It's not on big things. And also, like I told you before, but I think it adds also, when you tell your students to um, engage themselves in chesed projects, I think that gives because it's known, as studies have shown that when you give, you're really receiving. So yeah. they're receiving back, I think, in the identity. Beautiful. So Jewish pride. Then you mentioned Jewish knowledge. Uh, today, everything's on Google. How do you put it implemented here <laughs> inside the brain and the heart? Uh, you know, if, if people think I, I don't have to learn by heart, I can always ask the Rav or text the Rav and uh, uh, why should I learn hard things or ancient texts? Right, right. So today you find everything on Google, but because information is so easy to access, knowledge is becoming less and less and less and more difficult. Sometimes a teacher could say one word out of a whole context, and that's what we're going to remember for life. So we invest a lot in learning with the teachers. So for example, today it's Tuesday, today it's the day. Um, our school is over at four. Every single Tuesday, uh, teachers stay from four to six and we learn. Sometimes we learn Jewish context, what's gonna be taught in classes. Sometimes we learn about pedagogy and education, but we sit together, a whole team, uh, but Yaakov, it's a large school. If we have a thousand students, I know it's going to sound like a lot, but that's how many, how much we have. We have uh, 50, uh, 500 employees in our school. Wow. That's a lot. 500 employees? 500 employees. One for every teacher. two students. Yes, yes. The ratio, it's pretty crazy. One for two. Wow. Um, and everybody stays. So Tuesday, it's a learning day. Mm -hmm. wow. And that's very important, especially because we have such a, lot, a big variety of our, our uh, we have Sephardic kids, we have Ashkenazi kids. So we have to learn together uh, little things. For example, what's the Minhag Sephardi? What's the Minhag Ashkenazi? A teacher is going to come into the class and we have the funniest. We have some Sephardic kids whose name is Fegi, Beila, Spritze, <laughs> because the mom is Ashkenazi, yeah? and we have Rachamim Friedman also. So it, we have a nice, healthy blend, thank God, but we have to learn together to be able and, and, and to teach the right thing. And children today, students today, more than ever, they, are, they need authenticity. They cannot be played around. So mm -hmm. because the information is so easy to access. Yeah, so we have pride, we have knowledge, and now we have application, or in Hebrew, in Yiddish, 
תכלס, תכלס, למה יש? אקזקטי, אקזקטי. So when they're a little, we, we always make sure to uh, imbue um, alakha in everything that we teach. So we start our morning, the day starts with a beautiful tefillah and the students, they go and they wash their hands and that they make the brachot for the food that they eat. And we talk about everything that we do that looks like natural, but we give them the background. And then once they're growing a little old, we have it, one of our subjects, one disciplines, it is alakha and we teach them and we provide different projects that puts them to practice, to put into the tachlis. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Now, um, I want to uh, maybe uh, show you a short video of uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory. Um, I think it describes exactly what you said, Jewish continuity. This is maybe the result of everything, uh, all the values you mentioned. Let's see this short video and we'll continue because the fifth chapter is about COVID and COVID in Brazil. We all heard about what's going on uh, in, in your country. So a short video about, I would say, um, your part in the mutual story. Pina. Okay. I have a little dream. It goes like this. You are wandering through an enormous library. It has millions of books. And you're looking at all the titles of the books and then suddenly you stop dead. There's a book, and on the title, it's got your name. You take it out. See, what is this book that has your name written on it? And you open it up, and you see that there are several hundred pages of that book written by many different hands in different languages. And you try and work out what this book is. And with a shock, you realize that this book has been written by your ancestors. Every single one of them telling their story and handing it on to their children and as you get to the end of the book with a shock you see that that empty page has your name on it and you realize that is the chapter that you have to write now you're in the middle of this line can you just put that book on the shelf and walk away and forget it i don't think you can really because if you did all those 200 generations of your ancestors would have kept that book going in vain because it would have stopped with you. I kind of think I couldn't do that. If they put their faith in their children to keep the book going, then they have all put their faith in me. And I have to write my chapter in that book. And when the time comes, give that book on to my children and grandchildren. That is what it is to be a Jew. To be a Jew is to be part of the most remarkable story ever lived by any people, covering more countries, more adverse circumstances, more triumphs and tragedies than any other story. And then the sudden realization that every one of us has a chapter to write in that story and hand the book off. That is what it is to be a Jew. And the second I realized that, I knew I couldn't walk away. I had to write my chapter and then give the book to my children and grandchildren. Wow, so that's a beautiful message. And uh, Hani Bigon, uh, San Paulo, Brazil, Bet Sefer, Bet Yaakov is with us. And the fifth chapter, the last chapter in this conversation is about COVID. Uh, we cannot ignore it, not in, here in Israel, but in Brazil, I think the situation was awful. I don't know what is uh, the uh, circumstances right now, but uh, I still remember the day you had uh, more than half a million people who passed away in Brazil. You, uh, they mentioned it on the news. Yes, yes, it was very bad. We were hit very bad. And unfortunately, uh, we don't live in a country that we could count on the government to run things. So there was a lot of uh, polarization within the government. Uh, throughout the peak of the COVID, we had so many um, health ministers that they didn't stay more than a week. It was a joke already. So wow. we went through a very hard time. Um, the health, the, the public health in Brazil in general, it's very, very bad. So uh, we went through a very hard time. In school, I could say, and we're actually celebrating because we were just released from the face mask. 
a wow. few days ago. So, so that's a big um, victory and a reason to celebrate. Um, but but Betyakov was always on the front with everything. It was the first school, if the first uh, Jewish school to announce that we're closing, that we're going online, uh, way before the government thought about it. And then what happened was that two days after we closed, the government decreed that every school must close. So wow. what happened was we were lucky that we were able to prepare our teachers to go on Zoom, to use technology, to prepare our parents, to prepare our students. So we were very much on the front in that sense. It was very hard. Uh, as, as best as we were trying to be, nothing compares um, presential and, and being in school. But I think we did very good. And we had a very interesting situation here during COVID, during the months that we were that school was closed, we received 60 new students. Oh, how come? People were leaving schools, not coming to schools because a lot of schools were not able to maintain that speed and parents felt. A lot of our students uh, during the quarantine, they left Sao Paulo. Um, they went to their country sites or their like summer homes. And they were dealing, they were living together with students uh, from other schools and families saw the difference on the, on the daily commitment. So I think it was a, a, a big differential to our school, that, the amount of families that came to join Betekov during That's this beautiful. period. Families that also got Jewish education before or new families from uh, lower? Both, both, lower both. Schools. We have families that were in other Jewish schools, but a lot of families left non-Jewish schools that to that beautiful. we feel wow. very happy for. Um, the entire um, quarantine uh, period gave us a lot of um, reflection some things we saw that are so much better accomplished um, through Zoom. The others just gave us the, the, the reinforcement, how much important it is for children to interact. And um, it, was, it, was, it was very good. Like, you know, they say that when, when challenges, when adversity hits you, you cannot ask just to leave the adversity. You have to come better than that. We definitely could say that it was a big, big uh, milestone for us in terms of technology. We thought we were doing good, but we learned so much more during this period. And a lot of things came out from this, from this period. One of the things that came out from this period was the ability and the, how close the world became. So all of a sudden we have teachers teaching from the United States, from Israel, lectures, that we were able to bring to our school virtually that uh, otherwise we didn't have the geographically uh, the geographic limit. Mm -hmm. But still, you sound so positive. Still, uh, I think hundreds of thousands of hours of kids with uh, uh, TV, YouTube, Netflix, uh, TikTok, etc. Uh, don't you see the differences now when they came back to school? Yeah, when we did. Uh, I started with the positive. It's definitely not <laughs> yeah. the only thing, unfortunately, that we have to say. Um, we see, we call the pandemic um, um, kids. Some, some, some grades were hit. Uh, how uh, how do you call it? Pa pandemic kids? The pandemic students, because some um, kids, we have, for example, the students who are graduating this year, they barely had um, high school. We were almost 10 months uh, virtual in 2020. Don't forget that our school begins in January until December. So we, wow. we close our school March 16. So mm -hmm. we, we stayed the entire year. And then 2021, we had a second wave and we closed already for, an, uh, we closed again for another two months. So it's been two years that Purim and Pesach we were not in school. So we see now wow. the, the gaps that we built. I could say that the, the wrong use of technology is one of the largest uh, gap. Another large gap was the, um, the risky factors. I think because of students, they were, they were deprived from normal healthy things that kids do. They went to look for the whatever they were able to look and not, and a lot of them are not the healthy kids. So we have, we had an improve with um, students experiencing alcohol um, more than we always had and other, other concerns. 
but that gave us also um, a reflection that came out with the lesson. We developed a new class in school in their weekly um, routine. It's called SAFE. It's an American program that we do with uh, risky factors and, and um, how, do you, how do you educate students for that. Um, also, we have a, a CRIA for many, many, for the grades that we're dealing with CRIA, Kita Aleph, Kita Bet, Kita He, we see that they have so much, such a hard time, CRIA and math especially, that they need a yeah. teacher looking at them. So we're still collecting, you know, the fragments. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and we're dealing with it here too uh, in Israel. Uh, it's a mutual problem. I want to ask you, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, we really, I think, uh, spoke about uh, so many different elements in your life and in every teacher's uh, life and principle. Uh, the teacher Esti from Israel is asking, uh, everything you described is re really interesting. 500 teachers, 1,000 uh, uh, students. Uh, the question no, is, let me correct. It's not 500 teachers. No, no, workers. 500 employees. Yes. Employees, employees, also the, the cleaner and the guard, every, security, but still, it's a private school. And that's maybe the main difference, right? People pay and they pay a lot. Tuition in the States, in Brazil, in Europe. So we interview principals from abroad, but still in Israel, Baruch Hashem, it's the public system, okay? The public schools are Jewish Orthodox schools. You don't pay so much. But at the end of the day, maybe you don't get so much. I mean, your system is different. Right. So first of all, in Brazil, we don't, we cannot count on public system. The, the aid that the government gives, it's very little, it's very narrow. I mean, barely there. The public schools, they're very um, much low of any expectations, unfortunately, for all the people that cannot get a good education. So Jewish schools, all Jewish schools are private. Yes, tuition is very expensive. And as you said, you get for what you pay. I mean, we we thank God they're able to give our students a lot, but the parents, they pay for it. Now, the last question, uh, before we say goodbye from you, Shalom to San Paulo, is about Israel. You mentioned the fact you take, you bring the kids to Israel. Now for two, almost three years, uh, it wasn't possible. Do you think something is lacking? I mean, they're missing something. It's part of their Jewish identity, this trip. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're hoping, we're really hoping that this trip happens this year, Bezat Hashem. But and, and we're going to take the students that didn't go 2020, 2021. Right. But we see that they're that the the loss was enormous, both in Jewish identity, in passion, love for Israel, for their brothers, for their sisters. But besides, for the their human and identity, we feel like. We were able throughout through the trip. We were able to give them, you know, values that they could take for life. You know, you miss Israel. Israel misses you. It's not the same without all those Jewish tourists. You know, I live in here in Yerushalayim. The Kotel is mm -hmm. empty without you. Even Machne Yuda is empty without mm -hmm. the languages and the accents and all those Jewish groups. And we're, we we definitely miss you and hope to see you here soon. Um, Hani Bigon, thank you very much uh, for your time and for the meaningful messages. Toda raba. Toda lekol amorim, lekol amenahalim shetzafu banu. Nipagesh mifgash harevii vead adaz besorot avot bakitav mihutzala leitrav. Toda raba, toda raba. It was my pleasure. Thank you.